Hi, Dodo. Very Hi. good to, to have you here. I'm Bernard Dern, I'm Editor-in-Chief of Developmental Medicine and Child Neurology. And I'm Dido Green, Associate Editor of Developmental Medicine and Child Neurology. And we're here to talk. Yeah, we've chosen two papers that we've been looking at in the June issue of Developmental Medicine and Child Neurology. Um, the first one is Selective Control of the Upper Extremity Scale, Validation of a Clinical Assessment Tool for Children with Hemiplegic Cerebral Palsy, and the other is the psychometric properties of a revised version of the assisting hand assessment, the Kids AHA version 5. And it's kind of intriguing to look at these two side by side because both um, assessments for um, the upper limb for mm -hmm. a similar presentation or different presentations of children with cerebral palsy, the one focusing more on um, the unilateral mm -hmm. distribution or impairments and the other potentially considering the interrelationship between the, uh, the unilateral impairment and the functionality, generally speaking. Mm -hmm. So these are two papers that, that are in the June uh, 2016 issue of the journal, but we have been receiving and publishing more and more papers on this topic of evaluation of the upper limb in cerebral palsy. Yeah, it's really quite interesting because um, is it a reflection of the fact that we can measure these things or that we really want to? So I brought in a couple of items from the AHA, mm -hmm. the transportable ones, and thinking about the skills a child might need to do and understand in order to play with um, a small toy mm -hmm. or um, tasks that relate to maybe school-based tasks and being able to find things inside and manipulate different objects. And interesting enough, with the selective control of the upper extremity scale, there's no item in that scale. It's a, a toyless mm -hmm. measurement, in effect, of the movement and capacity, of, particularly around the joints, so mm -hmm. a more specific focus of a, a discrete skill in relation to performance. Um, and the authors of this have been involved previously in the development of the Shrine Hospital mm -hmm. Upper Extremity Evaluation, yeah. mm -hmm. which was an object-based interaction, um, scoring some similar aspects of positioning of the limb mm -hmm. while moving, you know, yeah. interacting. And one of the items in that is, I always think it's quite funny to present a wallet to a two-year-old and find how many of them know how to take the money out. Um, but the, the functionality of that skill um, and they're scoring both of the house scale, the spontaneous function assessment of mm -hmm, that, mm -hmm. and the um, positional sense of the hands. Um, so they're, they're kind of interrelated, these scales, because the AHA also scores some of the positions and grips and functions, but in a more dynamic sense. Mm -hmm. But we, we're both in the activity dimension. Yes. Um, although the upper extremity, the, the selective control of the upper extremity scale has arisen in somewhat and is related to the literature on the difficulties children with cerebral palsy have mm -hmm. on just moving the limb they want to move in the way they want to move it. Mm -hmm. So in some respects it related in my mind very similarly to the quality of upper extremity skills test, the QUEST, that was developed quite a few years ago, mm -hmm. um, which is a range of movement scale. Mm -hmm. Um, but you get discredited if you have some associated movements or are unable to um, do that. So if we were looking at the movement at the shoulder, if they weren't able to get above 50 degrees mm -hmm. of abduction without the a limb being constrained in its mm -hmm. movement, they wouldn't get the score on that. Mm -hmm. So in some respects, this selective control of the upper extremity has taken the quest a little bit further in making that a correct, part of the scoring is whether they can achieve that movement mm -hmm. without some interference of another body part moving that shouldn't move. Yeah. Well, actually both have a history, um, and, and clearly this one wants to relate it to Shuri too, but both are seen as attempts uh, at refining uh, what's in existence and trying to identify areas where we should be better. And, and yet we, we're finding ourselves um, wanting more, and clearly there can be further developments. Yes, and what was quite interesting about this is was, was that the selective control of upper extremity scale wasn't compared to the AHA. Mm -hmm. It was compared to the manual ability classification scale, so a classification yeah. system, and didn't relate 
there were not strong correlations between mm -hmm. the scale of that. And um, it also related to the spontaneous functional assessment mm -hmm. of the um, shui, but not necessarily the positioning mm -hmm. of scale. Now, so there this one is coming from the United States, this one is from Europe, from Sweden. Do you think that some cultural aspects or cultural aspects relating to practice there in the United States and in Northern Europe? It may be, in some respects, I hadn't thought of that. But thinking of the types of clinics that these have arisen mm -hmm. from, this is the more uh, interaction of the activity and performance level mm -hmm. of the children, and this is more in an orthopedic service looking at um, liaising and thinking how to advise on uh, the next step of intervention at, um, at a more discrete level of performance. So looking at whether surgery is advised or botulinum toxin is advised. And these authors have been more involved in working with, um, more recently anyway, with the AHA, in behavioural interventions. Right. So we, so we said that, that both of them are clearly anchored uh, into the activity dimension, but would you say that this uh, is anchored there with a clearer link uh, back to, um, to body structure um, and function, and this one more to, to the other end uh, of this dimension to its participation? I think what we don't know yet with the selective control of the upper extremity scale, um, it's so new and it's nice the way they've tried to really look at the content validity and really hone down on what that mm -hmm. is. I'm wondering whether it, as it gets developed their scoring criteria could become more refined mm -hmm. and actually inform more of different types of interventions or what use we would make of this scale if mm -hmm. you weren't going to be thinking of a more discreet mm -hmm. surgical mm -hmm. or casting or body positioning mm -hmm. um, intervention. So it's sort of at the um, it's starting out, whereas the um, the assisting hands assessment, the kids aha version five, is a very nice refinement and review of the previous versions yeah. of the mm -hmm. aha, and quite timely to consider what we're doing with our assessments mm -hmm. and what, what we want them to help us with. Now, in this complex landscape, how do we make sense of, of all these different scales and, and we, we getting more and more and with good validation, how are we going to use them in practice and uh, how do they take us um, further in terms of research? That's a, a very fascinating question because I think we do need to work really closely with our clinicians on mm -hmm. the one hand to find out well, how meaningful is it for them, whether these are just case report studies or some information back to the researchers mm -hmm. to say that I was reading this um, from my experience of working 20 years in a clinical service and then more recently full-time in research, thinking they could exploit that scoring system in much more detail to help me as a clinician mm -hmm. to think, well, are they mirrored movements or are the associated body postures due to spasticity or mm -hmm. um, related to some degree of secondary contractures and the difficulties of moving, the effort of moving. And those all, as a clinician, would tell me of a very different intervention pathway to go. Mm -hmm. And in some respects, we need to have those studies to see, well, did the shoe, this the shui or the, the new selective mm -hmm. control of upper extremity scale predict or help us with our clinical um, decision making mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or taking that in the preliminary steps and you know, phase two, phase three studies looking mm -hmm. at what information does this give us at a research level mm -hmm. to which children are responding from what type of intervention. What I like about the, this new scale is that it seems fairly cheap and cheerful. Mm -hmm. um, what was a little bit of unclear is how much time in the training to get the reliability and the interrater um, reliability because mm -hmm. it's is again they're both a little subjective in the scoring um, so we would need to know um, how much training is involved how much time that takes because mm -hmm. that also impacts on its clinical utility mm -hmm. um, that needs no special tools because there aren't any the aha does require a bit more training and a bit quite a bit of experience and keep checking back in that you don't slip into habits that confound the scoring of that. Mm -hmm. um, so they, they both have advantages but also some cost implications for translating that down into clinical practice. Would it make sense that, that these um, researchers meet each other um, 
well, they, they, they do in this issue, uh, but to see what sort of relationship there could be between the SKUs and this version of the AHA. I, I think that would be really helpful. Um, we saw a sort of um, equivalent in a previous version, the February mm -hmm. version of Development of Medicine and Child Neurology, where they looked at three different assessments or mm -hmm. three different, um, coming from three different angles of uh, neurology um, or three different sort of uh, spheres of that to understand dystonia. And the, in the Rosetta Stone study, each informs differently, mm -hmm. they complement each other and give us a richer understanding of the nature of dystonia. And it would be nice to see perhaps these two working closer together mm -hmm. because I could see they could complicate complement each other quite easily and the one is not an onerous, they're not onerous mm -hmm. um, administration to deliver time-wise. Um, certainly I haven't yet administered this one so I can't comment on how easy it would be to pick it up from the materials that are provided. Have you tried this one? The, I haven't tried scoring the new AHA um, uh -huh, because it's just out. We've, mm -hmm. we've been looking and I have undertaken the training to look at the um, what the different scales, mm -hmm. um, the scoring systems would be and um, whether it's going to be the scoring. If you're used to you know the bad habits, of, if you're used to scoring according to the original mm -hmm. versions, how easy it is to uh, shift in um, your scoring criteria. Um, but the, the nice thing that they di did provide here um, and I thought that was considering the amount of studies we've had on the upper limb and rehabilitation and measurement is the a very nice trans, uh, transformation of the original version mm -hmm. to the new scoring with an equivalented um, uh, unit scale. So we can take the new version and compare results. We don't have to throw away all our research yes, from yes, previous. That, and I thought that was useful. Um, very useful. And I wanted to have a, a full page sort of supplement to online. Um, page of this to print out mm -hmm. for my reference for my file or my notice board to make sure I can use it, I will be using it. Okay, well, I'm sure other people in the field will, will do just the same. Thank you, thank you very much, Naido. Uh, I think it, it very nicely highlights these important papers and uh, it's really nice to have brought them uh, together and clearly that's the future. Thank you.